Um, so we're just going to do a, a panel discussion. So I'll introduce my fellow panelists, and then I'll just ask each of them a question to start us off. And then we're well, we're um, eager to hear your your questions and comments. So um, Evelyn Nakano Glenn, one of the country's leading sociologists, is a professor of the Graduate School, and was the founding director of the Center for Race and Gender at UC Berkeley. Her groundbreaking books on the intersectionality of race gender, citizenship, and labor include Forced to Care, Coercion and Caregiving in America, Unequal Freedom, How Race and Gender Shaped American Citizenship and Labor, and Issei Nisei War Bride, Three Generations of Japanese American Women in Domestic Service. Honors she has received include the Asian American Local Heroes Award from KQED and Union Bank, and the Nikkei of the Biennium Award for Contributions to Education from the Japanese American Citizens League. She's also my mother. <laughs> and the daughter of the middle of the three sisters, Lillian. Michael Omi is an associate professor in Asian American and Asian Diaspora Studies at UC Berkeley. His most influential work is Racial Formation in the United States from the 1960s to the 1990s, co-authored with Howard Winant. Omi and Winant's racial formation theory has transformed how we understand race as a socially and historically constructed identity determined by social, economic, and political forces. He is a recipient of UC Berkeley's Distinguished Teaching Award, an honor bestowed on only 240 Berkeley faculty members since the award's inception in 1959. And he is not a relative. <laughs> So I'll just we'll start with Evelyn. So Evelyn, mom, could you please talk a little bit about the precarious citizenship status of the American-born children of aliens ineligible to citizenship, such as your mother and her sisters? And could you talk maybe a little bit about the parallels that you see to dreamers and the children of undocumented populations today? Thank you for the, those uh, penetrating questions. <laughs> uh, yes. Uh, one of my interests has been in American citizenship and the way it was originally constructed um, as a white male citizen. And you can sort of see that in the quotes that are in the movies um, of talking about the American standard of living and uh, you know who is a citizen. And so even though what has happened over the uh, 200 years since the Constitution was um, formulated that all the groups that were originally uh, excluded uh, became included, like women um, and, and blacks and uh, you know other categories of people. But um, what I would argue is that there is still a kind of uh, provisionalness or precarity for people who don't fit that original white male category. So when there's some kind of um, social upheaval or a situation like war, uh, those people do not have that kind of security and their formal citizenship is actually not recognized by other Americans. And so you see that in sort of in the same uh, situation today with uh, certain minorities like Latinos who are uh, uh, suspected of being undocumented immigrants, uh, certainly with um, Muslim uh, Americans who are seen as uh, not only un-American, but you know, anti-American. And so I think this is an important kind of notion to remember that entire history because uh, as we see in the present day, some of these same things, the white nationalism and so forth, um, do arise. Uh, and this has been a big shock to many of us that it would arise at this point so late in, in our history. So um, I think it's important to remember that. Absolutely, thank you. And Michael, could you talk a little bit about the lessons that you think that we should take from the anti-Japanese movement in the early 20th century and how those lessons can be applied, again, given the current anti-immigrant, anti-Muslim political climate? Um, let me say first about, about, yeah, there's a lot of lessons. Uh, <laughs> but I think one of the most interesting things first is to, is to think about how uh, the lives of these individual women were so indelibly shaped by historical circumstances like migration, like the Depression, the onset of war, 
uh, incarceration. And it's a, it's a real reminder to us how um, that our lives are very fragile in many respects. And I think with respect to the broader sort of contextual lessons, it's important for us to remember how the injustices of the past continue to haunt the present. And there's ways in which uh, I, I hope you do know that there's still this kind of tension within the law as well. And I think Professor Doreen Kondo alluded to some of this too uh, in talking uh, in, in her discussion, which was the ways in which um, we're always, uh, there's a tug of war between national security and civil liberties to a large extent. And uh, Supreme Court Justice uh, Robert Jackson in his dissent during the Korematsu case, uh, arguing that um, Fred Karamatsu's civil liberties were in fact infringed upon, uh, talks about how the majority decision to suggest that military necessity and also the exigencies of war uh, prompted national security concerns should, should trump civil liberties. And he said that that lied like a loaded gun uh, waiting to be used at any time when the government officials could in fact make plausible claims for um, issues around national security. And I think that's something uh, that we need to be reminded of, particularly as we see uh, the kinds of uh, national security concerns being evoked around the travel ban, uh, the kinds of surveillance which has gone on around uh, mosques, and the ways in which anti-Arab and anti-Muslim sentiment uh, is raised to this level that the civil liberties need to be dispensed with because we have these broader concerns around terrorism. I mean, really made to the fore in 2015, we had Democratic mayor of Roanoke, Virginia, David Browers, uh, making a parallel between Japanese Americans during World War II and Syrian refugees coming into the United States, saying that just as uh, President um, Franklin Delano Roosevelt needed to make this decision, we may need to make a decision about trying to root out the kind of ISIS terrorists that come with that kind of refugee population. So these things, you know, sort of uh, uh, continue within the popular imagination and also within a lot of mainstream political discourse. Um, just one last thing to think about that wartime situation. You know, in about 2014, I think it was about four, four years ago, uh, Justice Anthony, uh, Anton Scalia was asked about if we had the same situation happen today as we did during World War II, uh, what would we do? And uh, Scalia evoked this phrase in Latin, which translates to, uh, in times of war, the courts remain silent. And his point was that there's a kind of judicial deference, if you will, to, in fact, issues around national security that may mean that civil liberties suffer as a result. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, so we're eager to hear if people have questions or comments, and I believe Elizabeth has a if you a have a question, please raise your hand, and I will come with you to a mic so that we can hear your questions. We'll start over here. First of all, thank you so much. That is really fantastic. Um, we have a project called um, Project Ace, All Colors Entertainment. And so um, I deal a lot with immigrant kids that are being arrested right now in the high schools and junior highs. And, uh, um, I just wanted to ask you, um, basically, um, where where can we show this particular? You know, we have like 500 schools that we get to enter, and um, it's a great. I'm, the message must be told, and, and I love the way um, you delivered it. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, right now we're we're focusing on screening events and um, festivals. We have a couple of festivals coming up. Um, and we're also preparing for our public television uh, premiere. Hopefully in August, September, it's going to start up at the Sacramento PBS station, and then hopefully they'll help us to get into some other as well. And then after that, we're planning to hopefully produce DVDs. And people have been talking about the possibility of creating curriculum materials to go with the film. So that's those are all kind of next steps that we would be excited to do. So thank you. And I, I would love to talk to you afterwards. Thank you. Well, thanks, thanks to them. I get credit for uh, being the mother of this, of this genius. Yeah. 
on that note, I had a question for Antonia as a filmmaker. I'm um, increasingly myself moving into playwriting and exploring other narrative and artistic registers to impart our messages. Could you talk a little bit about the, is the, the decision to use animation and, um, you know, it was beautiful and visually arresting and emotionally compelling, I thought, just really effective, as was the film uh, as a whole, but I, ju I just wanted to ask about the, that particular aspect. Thank you, and that's the wonderful Doreen Kondo, who's one of the scholars in the film. Um, the idea to, yes, please. <laughs> The idea to include uh, the sort of the illustrations came from my co-producer and editor, Greg Pacificar, who unfortunately is not here today. But we were trying to come up with a visual element for some of the storytelling because we had a lot of kind of static um, shots of the sisters talking, but we wanted something to be able to look at. And so it was his idea um, to bring in, is Manny, did Manny come into this space? Manny Falcon Padua? Because he was here, he may have been in the other room, but he is a, a wonderful artist. And so he created all of the um, illustrations, they're all original, and they were inspired largely by photographs of the family. Um, and uh, also they used sort of a color scheme that's supposed to be reminiscent of woodblock prints. So he often would use sort of a salmon sort of tint at, at the top or in blue at the bottom. So all of that was original. And is, is, is uh, Kenny here? Did he come over from the other room? Maybe he's in the other room. Um, Kenny is our After Effects artist. And so he really created the, the movement and kind of made it look like animation, even though it's essentially you know, still illustrations. So um, not being a filmmaker myself, my background is in, is in theater, I was really blessed to work with you know, fantastic uh, film artists, including Dave Iwataki, who's the composer who created all of the music you know, originally for the, for the film, which is wonderful. And unfortunately, Dave's not here as well. But, um, <laughs> but so yeah, I, I, was, I was blessed because Greg sort of started the ball rolling. Um, and my cousin, Aaron Takahashi, was the one who sort of hooked me up with, with Dave. And so, yeah, so I've, I, was, I was very, very blessed to work with these great artists. So thank you. Any other questions? I see. <laughs> we'll go right here, and then I'll come down to the front. Uh, again, thank you so much for a wonderful um, film. I had a question about the, um, it really comes up in the last, I guess, 10 or 15 minutes about that post-war transition where the um, Asian American community begins to be um, described as this model minority uh, community. And I don't think that's due to kind of self-reflection by like white supremacists, like they're all, oh yeah, actually we're gonna like recognize this community now. So I, could you talk a little bit about how you interpret that transition, kind of the, the stakes involved in that as being now described as a model minority and whether that um, resonated at all with your grandmothers, um, with, I mean, did that, did they uh, kind of narrate that transition in the way they're, they were um, thought about by the community, or was it not really come up? I know it's kind of a it's a multi-parted question. Any piece of it would be helpful. Um, I, I, you know, maybe uh, Antonia could talk more specifically about how um, the subjects of her film dealt with it. Uh, you know, just think about it in a historical context. Uh, it's really important to think about when the model minority image of Asian Americans arose which, um, in, at least in the popular press, was in the mid-60s. And if you recall, the, for those of you who are old enough, the mid-60s were a particularly traumatic period of American race relations. We had the Watts riots followed by most major cities in the United States going up in flames for several years between 1965 and 1967. And it's, um, there was an amazing uh, commission, which we recently celebrated the uh, 50th anniversary of the Kerner Commission, which was a presidential commission to look at those civil disorders and the sources and causes of them. And in many ways, what that commission said, which was a bipartisan commission of a lot of political elites, was that the United States uh, was moving to two countries, one white, one black, separate and unequal. And that the main problem was, in fact, institutional racism. That our major institutions, the courts, healthcare delivery, education, uh, were uh, you know, subject to uh, a whole host of racial disparities, and that, in fact, these were institutionally uh, driven policies and practices. And within that, it's interesting that that's when William Peterson, among one of the people cited here, who was a sociologist and demographer, um, 
start talking about, well, you know, Japanese and particularly the East Asians, it was focused on Japanese and Chinese, are really doing pretty well and they were subject to a lot of discrimination. So maybe the problem isn't institutional discrimination. Maybe it has a lot to do with who you are as a group. And so there was a particular way in which it, it shifted the focus, or it was meant, I really believe, as a critique of the institutional racism perspective, to say, well, maybe it's about you know, culture, and maybe it's about group attributes and so forth. And what it did during that period was to really paper over a large number of disparities and, and ways in which Asians were still pretty marginalized to characterize Chinatowns during that period, which were really ghettos. High, high rates of, of, of underemployment, um, as well as you know, high centers of tuberculosis, was really a kind of mischaracterization. I'm sorry, I shouldn't. I'm gonna keep this short. You know, so you shouldn't invite these scholars here because, like, <laughs> man, I start talking and pretty soon it's five o'clock and we're still talking about some of these things. But the point I want to make is that it occurred within a specific historical context, and it was particularly framed as a way for understanding. Or what race and racism were like was like in the United States during a particular period. I, th I think that's incredibly well said. Um, I, I don't remember sort of a grandma or the other sister sort of necessarily reflecting on the changing status of you know or the changing reputation of Japanese Americans. I don't know if you have any yeah, I don't. additional thoughts. I, I don't. I mean, I think there was a certain amount of I suppose cultural um, chauvinism. You know that Japanese culture is good and you know our people are good you know which I think is common to a lot of communities but I think basically um, Michael's point is straight on that you know that has to be uh, you know uh, the, the praise has to be seen within this larger context of what is what is the kind of politics behind that and it's sort of saying well there are minorities that you know are have done inc incre incredibly well despite all these different hardships so one should look a certain with a certain amount of um, s suspicion on those kinds of uh, praises that are heaped on certain groups. Yes, and, and let me just make one last point about that too, is that um, this focus on like the reception or the popular acceptance of culture is really a kind of problematic thing in many respects because before it was argued that it was Japanese culture which was so foreign that they would never assimilate. That's why you have to exclude them. So what happened then, there was a total different take on what the Japanese group attributes and culture was and whether or not uh, that was uh, seen to resonate with American values. Whereas at a different point in time, it gets resurrected in a totally different way. Okay, I wanna say, first of all, that was such a moving film. It felt both personal and educational. Um, artistically, it was so well done. The music was brilliant. Congratulations. I was blown away. Um, it's so funny. What struck me the most in watching the film is that in a hundred years, how so much has changed and yet how so much has remained the same. And I had a question for the scholars. I read a book recently called White Trash. Do you know this book? Um, it's about how in the founding of the great United States. Um, the people who originally came and settled America was a tiny percentage of aristocrats with um, the ability to plan out cities and knew how to, to cultivate the land, and a huge majority of prison inmates and the unwanted. And so the, the book's title, White Trash, is to say that most of white America is descendants of like really Europe's outcasts. And as we sort of move forward right now in, in the political climate, the, the, I feel like the, the prejudice coming out of these, this majority white male, it's so loud. And I'm, I'm wondering like what are our hopes looking forward um, do you see more integration or do you see more segregation? And how do we counter this really loud prejudice that's coming at us? I feel like the media is so dominate, dominated by these voices and yet um, the numbers of brown people and non-white people is really significant now and yet you don't hear it in the mainstream media. What is our hope? 
<laughs> oh, well, okay, thank you. Thanks a lot. <laughs> suddenly, suddenly oh, Michael you. is uh, silent. No. Uh, <laughs> no, I was going to say, uh, well, you know, part of it, it you know, the, you know, one could sort of say uh, this is the, I don't know whether you could say last gasp, but I don't think it is the last gasp, but, but there is an age kind of effect in terms of, you know, sort of attitudes about sort of, you know, white, you know, the necessity of white dominance. Um, and I think in the younger generation that, that is, uh, you know, not so much true. But um, I think um, one of the things that's interesting in terms of California, that, which is so multicultural, is we forget the way in which it was sort of seen as this ideal of white equality. Uh, you know, it was an anti-slavery state and they wanted, you know, sort of a, almost a radical equality among people, but the radical equality would be among whites. And so I think that was, um, so, you know, a white European immigrant coming to California could immediately purchase land, could immediately vote. And in a lot of states, they, uh, white immigrants were allowed to vote even before they became, became citizens. So there was, the, the American promise was kind of a one of equality among whites. So you know, you're talking about people who were uh, white trash or something, trash in Europe coming and sort of attaining a certain degree of equality. And I think that that whole kind of democratic dream also, but it was sort of existed alongside this notion of other groups that were, um, you know, considered, um, you know outsiders, foreigners, and not part of the republic. And so there, I think there's always been that uh, consciousness. But I would say kind of historically, um, one could, uh, from an optimistic point of view, think that there, there is a kind of generational change uh, that has gone on in terms of attitudes about a lot of things, in, you know, including this uh, more inclusive um, notion of the na of the nation and what America is so you know unless uh, well I'll just sort of end there because I could kind of go on and on just like Michael <laughs> no Michael does it a lot better than I do <laughs> let me just say I just pick up on on Evelyn's last point about uh, you know there I think what's at stake is around American identity who's who is an American now and how we think about that and I think uh, for uh, a large, uh, you know, I mean, yeah, we could go back and su suggest at certain point in times it was really unclear who whites were. Irish certainly weren't white, as we understood that in their in their period of immigration and faced uh, a whole host of, of discriminatory uh, treatment towards them. Um, but what we're seeing here is that demographically, uh, whites are becoming more of a minority. And this is kind of a fall from grace in some ways, you know, where it was assured that you had a kind of majoritarian position. Now, you're not so sure. And then people start thinking, well, you know, there's a shrinkage of middle class. Things aren't going so well. Uh, there's always other folks to blame, you know. There's always others. We're losing out because of the flood of, of uh, undocumented folks coming from our southern border or uh, we're losing our grip as a nation because we no longer subscribe to sort of maybe uh, think about, you know, Islamophobia in certain ways. This kind of fear of that is really something which drives not only here, expressed here in the United States, but uh, across Western Europe as well. There's a way in which the West sees itself being threatened by uh, uh, a, 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 another group of people. It's a, it's a process of othering. It's a process that, you know, they are not us. And not only that, they'll undermine who we are if we keep them within our midst. And that leads to the whole host of things. Exclusion, you know, sort of, uh, in, in, in many ways, it's kind of a, a frightening scenario. And I think what's really important is for people to make interventions in that and to understand what's going on with respect to those processes and how to sort of challenge them in many respects, and how to draw on this history, how to draw on the Ito sisters' history as a way for us to understand how that's affected a group of people and how that continually will have this kind of um, effects on other groups of people as well, unless we kind of acknowledge that. 
You know, I think it was, um, I'll end on this one quote. I love this one. I think it's uh, Gore Vidal once said, um, noted writer, um, said, we're the United States of amnesia. Uh, we learn nothing because we remember nothing. And he's right. There's so many layers to this very masterful work that you've created. And I would encourage everyone, though, the layer that I'm going to sort of pick out, because it's so moving to me, and I think it's something that's often overlooked, and I don't want to overlook it, because throughout the film, this is woven into it. And that's about infancy and early childhood. We start out the journey of your great-grandmother coming to this country pregnant. So I would ask everyone to think about how the lives of people, how the policies we create, so deeply affect the children. And this is happening over and over again. Your film, I think, draws that out beautifully. When we see these elderly women talking and reminiscing, but you tie it back to their girlhood so strongly their experiences as school children. Think about that, school children who are learning from a long, young age the lessons that they're being taught that we don't want any children to learn. Think about that horrifying experience um, on the way to the camp where the baby is lost in this very traumatic way. And on and on, I mean, we can all think about this. And so I would encourage everyone to be thinking how these policies at these macro levels are affecting infants, young children, and throughout childhood. You mentioned the dreamers. But we also, I think, can't close this afternoon without talking about this horror that's happening where infants and other young children are being separated from their parents because that's now the policy that we have. And think about the trauma of the separation. Think about what's happening at the camps. And also, to give a nod to your mother, where she's introduced to us in the film in that beautiful picture of her as a little baby. And here we have sitting with us today <laughs> after all her experiences. And not to single you out, Evelyn, but again, think about this, this accomplished woman who we have sitting with us. But when you look at her, please think back to how we first meet her in the film as an infant on her mother's knee, as an infant and young child in camp, as an infant being separated at a mother from her mother again within the camp and living with her grandmother. So again, like other people out there, I could go on for quite a long time about this family element and um, infants and young children. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm going to cry. <laughs> Me too. Uh, as someone who was uh, honored to have been one of Antonia's professors at UC San Diego and UCI's PhD program, I'm, I'm thrilled. Now, she didn't study film with me. She studied theater. <laughs> <laughs> and I taught her everything she knows about theater. Everything. Everything. <laughs> but not about film. Uh, to, to draw attention to the transculturation that we see on the stage, Antonia Nakano Glenn, uh, Evelyn Nakano Glenn, you know, the, the intermarriage. There are two plays that are being developed. One that was already done, and I'm sure you saw Valley of the Heart by Luis Valdez. Val, uh, Luis Valdez, the founder of the Teatro Campesino, farm worker theater and uh, widely known, also wrote Zoot Suit and La Bamba and other things that, that most people know him for, but the farm workers were very much in, entwined with the Japanese American community. And so his play that's gonna be done at the taper in the fall, another remake of it called Valley of the Heart, is about a relationship between a Mexican-American, Chicano, and uh, uh, Nisi, I think it's a Nisi, uh, during this period, during the period of the, uh, the repatriation and the horrible concentration camps. One other point that I wanted to ask is, there, there, you, you chose to quote one of the, the beautiful ladies that when the Jews came and bought everything for very little money, and I wondered if you've gotten any flack 
from that. It's, it, uh, am I the only one who heard that? <laughs> it, it, it was striking to me, I, you know. Well, this is Jorge Huerta, who is not only my professor, but my mentor and my dissertation advisor. So thank you, Jorge. Um, I've not gotten flack yet. I, I was very troubled by that reference. Um, there, were, there were a couple of different references <laughs> that the sisters made, including the fire on the farm, which at one point Nancy said was started by st the stupid Filipinos, um, because the workers who were in that house were Filipino and Japanese, and there was some sense that a group of disgruntled Filipino farm workers who had started a separate fire and then gotten fired for it came back in and set this fire as revenge that then led to the deaths of some of the workers in the house. So, so Nancy made that reference. I chose to cut that one from, from the film. In this case, clearly the people who were, who were buying the property on this farm were not Jewish. And you know, the, I don't think there was any kind of significant Jewish population in that area. I don't know where they got the idea that, this, that the people who were doing this were Jewish. I assume it was some stereotype about you know, rapacious behavior. Um, I, I thought about cutting it out <laughs> and was trying to figure out how to kind of you know, slice it out because I, I wanted to keep the reference to the fact that their possessions were, were purchased for very little. Um, and sometimes long after having done the interviews, going through the footage, I would say, oh, I wish I had a different take <laughs> of that story, but I didn't. Um, so I, I chose to leave it in partly because I thought it also represented um, some of the prejudices that they had and that they expressed and that certainly within the within the Japanese American community there's there's uh, a certain racial pecking order <laughs> that my grandmother was was very unshy about expressing in terms of the desirability of who you would marry because it was like Japanese white Chinese like there's this whole like ladder of who was acceptable and I think it was Mexicans blacks and she was very cheerfully telling us about you know what the pecking order was. So that I didn't put in the film, but um, you're welcome. Um, but yes, I, 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 it, it is certainly an anti-Semitic moment from her, and no one has, 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 <laughs> has, has come up and, and, and you know, sort of confronted me about it, but I do find it troubling. But I, figured, I thought it was an honest expression of what she thought. So, but, but, but thank you for, for your, 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 your questions and comments. Thank you, thank you. We have time for one more question. Oh, I forgot the end. You can uh, pass the mic over to you. Okay. I know a lot of people feel this way since no one had a question. I just wanted to say this. Um, if the current administration would uh, let immigrants be here and study, especially the dreamers who are already here and studying, that we come out a generation or two later with a couple of PhDs. <laughs> you know, and immigration is what makes America great. My grandparents were immigrants. And, uh, and also, um, my wife is, you know, bicultural, and, um, you know, as this generation comes up and is uh, more, you know, just more open to mixed race marriages, that makes us better, too, in the end. I, I'm a fan of, of mixed race marriages <laughs> myself. <laughs> yeah. But I, do th I think the possibilities of kind of um, solidarity among different populations so that we can, you know, f you know, maintain the resistance response to what, you know, Susie was asking about sort of, you know, how we fight this, this particular, what I consider to be sort of an evil in, in our government and in our society. I just think that the opportunities for different populations to kind of work together and to say, you know, I think the Japanese Americans have very well articulated um, that the Islamophobia is, is unacceptable because Japanese Americans know where that leads. And these kind of incremental steps, I mean already the fact that, you know, as Jean was referencing, the, the fact that there are children today in cages being separated from their parents, the, the fact that we've gotten there and it feels so quickly um, is, is, is terrifying. And that that can be in any way considered normal, and that that can be considered in any way about, you know, national safety is, is, is appalling. Um, so I think I, I I hope that you know that some that this film can in some way be a part of you know larger conversations across different ethnic groups, um, and that again we can find that solidarity 
uh, to stand together and to say that there's more of us who oppose this kind of these kind of policies and this kind of position than are standing for it. Thank you so much. Um, any last words from our panelists? You said a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I, I, I would like to just um, echo, you know, what Jean said about the uh, taking of the children because when you look at it, it it's it's actually a form of um, kidnapping children in order to terrorize their parents, right? So it's not even about uh, national security, but it's like the for the most venal of reasons, and the fact that you know pe any people would even accept that as an explanation for that policy is 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 horrible. It, Donald Donald Trump's favorite word is horrible. <laughs> right. Everybody knows that the, the trauma the trauma for that, yeah. I, I just want to say I I just hope we come away from this too thinking about this this issue about how our own lives or the lives of people in our family are so, as I said, indelibly shaped by the, the circumstances yeah. and the context and the times we live in. And oftentimes we don't think that. We don't make that kind of link to see how our lives are so profoundly shaped by um, what is going around us. And uh, I think this film makes a, a really good, uh, presents that in a really intriguing way, in a really good way. So, yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you everybody for being here.